Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thanks for coming back to Fading Memories, gang. I so appreciate you listening every week. With me today is a wonderful guest with a unique topic, but we were just talking before I hit record. She has not been a caregiver, so that should tell you how unique and special her topic is. And um, lost my train of thought. <laughs> she is one of like maybe one or two or three guests that has not been a caregiver. So please help war- warmly welcome, my mouth will work today, Susan Salinger. She is the author of the book, Sidelined, How Women Can Navigate a Broken Healthcare System. So thanks for joining me, Susan. You're so welcome. I really appreciate you having me. What an interesting group of, you know, interesting podcast. Thank you so much. So tell us about yourself and what prompted you to write this book. Um, because as we know, most caregivers predominantly are women. Um, and if women are struggling to navigate the healthcare system as their own patients, you can imagine how much more challenging it is when they're trying to advocate for a loved one with some form of dementia. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And just to enhance what you were saying about women caretaking, I just read recently that women do 80% of all the caretaking in the world. I mean, it's universal. It transcends cultures. I was That blew me away. But anyway, about me, um, I'm a writer, obviously, a grandmother. I have four grandchildren, two of whom, well, now th- two have three of whom are adults. One just is, is going to be 19 very shortly. Another one is 17. So they're semi-adults. Um, and how I wrote this book, I mean, it was kind of a journey. But, you know, years ago when I, I'm in my 80s now, and when I was 20, 30, whatever I was, I agreed to have some surgery that I knew I didn't need. I had been on medication and I, the doctor said for osteoporosis and the doctor said, hey, I've got there's this new meds that, that have come out. They're supposed to be better for your bones. Let's give them a try. So sure. I mean, I'm, I was easy. No problem. So I tried them and then I began having symptoms. I had vaginal bleeding and I can't remember what else anymore. And he ran a bunch of tests. I said, you know, I know it's the, it's got to be the new meds. And he went, you know, no, 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 no. I've never had anybody else on this pill, you know, that with those symptoms that have been on anyway. So to make a long story short, he did a bunch of tests. He said, no, and everything seems fine. You better have exploratory surgery. And I agreed. I was young. I was frightened. I mean, so anyway, I had the surgery. Of course, everything was fine. And I went back on the old pill and the symptoms stopped. But I mean, incidentally, I wasn't angry at the doctor because if he'd been, he was looking for ovarian cancer. I knew he was. And if he'd been right, he would have saved my life. But he wasn't. And my point is that I had other options. I could have gone back on the old pill for a week or two. I mean, I wasn't going to die in five minutes. You know, I mean, it was silly. <laughs> but OK, so I did it. Life goes on. I had two young kids. And then when I was in my 50s, 60s, whatever, my husband and I sold our business and I retired. And that lasted for maybe two or three seconds. It was not my cup of tea. <laughs> it didn't work at all. So I went back to school my under threat of death from my family because I was driving everybody crazy. So I went to school and I ended up taking anthropology classes mostly because it was the only thing I could get into. And for, <laughs> isn't that funny? I really went back to get a degree. I had had a bachelor's in English. I was going to get a degree in psych or sociology, but they were full. So anyway, I took the anthro. And for one of the classes, I did a project on some women who had had hysterectomies. How I landed on that topic, I don't know. I've never had one, but something interested me. And one of those women, well, I think I interviewed, well, quite a few. And I would say less than half, but over a third, you know, had also agreed to the surgery, even though they didn't think they needed it. And that was really serious because theirs was irrevocable. Mine wasn't. But several of the women said, looking back on it, that they thought their symptoms were probably just premenopausal and they wish they hadn't had the surgery so that mm. of triggered my memory and i began to wonder how as women how do we make our medical decisions what goes into that those decisions that we do and why do we keep agreeing when we don't think we need it so i interviewed about 60 women 
and found a bunch of stuff that they had in common. They all had different diseases, but their decision process was quite similar, regardless of their particular disease. And many of them had agreed to medication surgeries that they weren't sure they needed. It was really interesting, actually. Um, but anyway, so that's a rather a long story of how I got into the book, but there it is. Well, no, it's actually a very interesting path. I think it's funny that you just ended up somewhere because it was the only thing available at the time. Yeah. <laughs> Is well, that maybe serendipitous at time? I mean, seriously. And I loved it, incidentally. Totally loved it. Um, I actually thought about getting a doctorate in it. And then I thought, no, I'd rather write. I didn't want to take all those <laughs> classes. But nevertheless, I mean, it was just, I loved it. More than anything I had taken as an undergraduate. It was, it was fun. Do you think that there's a correlation between accepting what was readily available and making medical decisions because they seem like, well, they must be the right thing, even though I don't think they're the right thing? Well, yeah, I do, actually. I think that, you know, we want physical relief. So when, when you know you're not feeling well and the doctor says, well, let's do this, that'll help you. It, it's so easy to jump in and say, sure. And one of the things that I did discover in my research is that women really hesitate to get second opinions. It's the way we're brought up. We don't want to hurt the doctor's feelings. We don't want to be rude. The doctor's the professional. You know, what do I know? That kind of thing. Um, so I think there's a lot of reasons that, that we really agree. It's just it's cultural as well. We've just been told to go with the flow and make it all work and be nice and all those all those things that all of us are told, you know. Well, you don't want to be seen as the, you know, the angry, unhinged woman. Well, it's interesting that you said that because one of the women I interviewed said she would never consider getting a second opinion. I went through the roof because that's one of my my things. But she said she would never consider it because she didn't want to be she was afraid she'd be labeled a difficult patient and that that would be put in her chart and it would sort of follow her every time she went to the doctor, there would be this chart, regardless of the particular doctor. I mean, it would be in the chart and she'd be labeled difficult and that would interfere with her ability to get care. And I, I couldn't say she she was 100% wrong. I mean, she wasn't. But second- Do they point, actually anybody, chart? Huh? Do they actually write that kind of stuff in your chart? Yeah, they, I, I guess they can. Sure. Yeah. Sure. I would just uh, think that they might hesitate to do that. We One switched health. Hope. Yeah, well, we switched healthcare providers, <laughs> and so I basically said, you know, send me all my medical files for like the last twenty years. Right, right. <laughs> Which isn't. I mean, I was gonna print it out for the new when I went for the initial appointment, and I'm like, oh, this is 130 plus pages. Then maybe I won't print it out for. Right, I won't print it out. Right. <laughs> um, so I would think maybe they would hesitate, just knowing that you know we do have the right to look at our own medical records, not that we could necessarily understand all of it. Right. But that, that would be interesting. But even, I know I kind of got that reputation when I was caring for my mom because, you know, I would always have to go in with my mom and I would always have to remind the staff that she had advanced Alzheimer's. I'd always have to remind them that no, we can't just collect urine the normal way. We have to put the little hat thingy in the toilet and i mean it's yeah. a little bit more of a process and it's maybe i'm unrealistic but it's like why is that crap not written down like why right. do i have to tell you this every single time right you're right like you you know i don't expect them to see my mom and go oh yeah her you know i know they're dealing with hundreds of people which is probably one of the problems with our healthcare system yes of course um but i was just so fresh i'm like would you just put a big red label on her chart that says Alzheimer's? Right. Stop running me through the ringer every time we come in because I got to explain all this crap to you guys every single time. Do you think so it's frustrating. because, like you were saying earlier, that they get so little training in Alzheimer's? What did you tell me for? What, what did you um, say? From what, what I, and I don't know if this has changed in the last two or three years, but the they generally get four hours of training in all eight years. That's, that is even less than menopause. Yeah. Unbelievable. You're right. Well, considering everybody's aging and it's a we've actually there's been a decrease in the uh cases of Alzheimer's lately, but there's still like the percentage has gone down because yes. we know more things, but because the population is aging, the number is still increasing. It's just not mm -hmm. increasing as fast as it could have, which is a good thing. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, right. But still. Um 
Yeah, I never really understood. I'm like, you know, they were so like, I don't care if you've got like a three by five inch red label. This is Alzheimer's right on the front right. of her it's chart. Not that tricky. No, you're absolutely I mean, right. it's not a to me, it's not a HIPAA violation. Put it on the inside. Right. I don't care. But every time I'd have to go uh -huh. and I was very always very careful. It took me a while to realize my mom didn't understand I was talking about her. Right. But there was one day they needed to do a blood draw. And we went in and thankfully the lab was really quiet. There was like one other person in there. So I lean over the desk and I tell the, the uh, phlebotomist technician, I guess is what they're called. And I said, I am here with my mom, her name, give all the, you know, inf excuse me, all the information they need. And I said, she has advanced Alzheimer's. You're going to have to ask her questions one at a time and you're going to have to speak slowly. So we, you know, go into the room and she literally said, looking at my mom now can you give me your name and your, your name and age and your date of birth blah, 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 blah. And i was like i barely understood that oh my goodness and my mom's just standing there blinking her eyes like you know huh which right. is totally understandable because i can't even get those words out clearly that quickly oh, so no that's crazy and i just looked at her and i said what about one question at a time and slowly did you not get because at that point, I'm like, I just told you that less than a minute ago. If it had been five or 10 minutes, I probably wouldn't have gotten snippy. Yeah, well, like, I don't blame you. <laughs> well, and I it was just, it was so frustrating because what they don't understand, and this, I don't know if we can maybe suss out some, some ideas on how to, how caregivers, women caregivers can deal with this. What they don't understand is what that action can trigger in somebody with a brain disease because now she's confused you know we don't always act our best when we're confused right of course and you know the the you know the place is not exactly you know it's not home it's not a cozy nice you know tea shop or something her anxiety can, must have been through the roof fortunately my it wasn't too bad for my mom but it could be i mean they could trigger some pretty sure. you know negative reactions and then now you've got angry person on right. top of caregiver who wants to beat you but calm the situation it's like right oh. yikes <laughs> yeah absolutely oh absolutely you know and it's just i guess i guess it's because they're so so short on time with each patient which is a problem right that we're not going to solve today but they it just I just got the impression this girl didn't listen and she wasn't very old, so I can call her a girl. <laughs> well, she obviously didn't listen because, or at least she couldn't remember more than two seconds, you know, geez. It, it, I think it just didn't register, you know, because she looked at me, my mom looked at me and everybody's I'm like, give me a break. Like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to have to do this stuff. I got my own things to do. Right. But this is, you know, the doctor's thinking this is necessary. Turned out it wasn't that necessary, but you know, you only know those things after the fact. You're like, well, we're, well, we're looking. Know, as I'm sure your audience knows, caregiving is a very, very, very stressful occupation because that's really <laughs> what it is. Yep. Um, and all I can say is one of the things I discovered in my book is that women, not necessarily caregivers, but w women put themselves last. We put everything ahead of ourselves our kids our pets our parents um and we put ourselves last in fact there was a, a research study done where researchers gave um one group of women who were caregivers of, they call it a punch biopsy they just stuck a needle in their arm you know it doesn't matter and then the other group they gave the punch biopsy to was a group of women who were not caregivers and the women that were not caregivers their wound if we can call it that healed a lot more quickly than those women who were caregivers because the stress of caregiving really slowed down their immune system. And that's why when I do talk to people that are caregivers, I always suggest that they put or try to recommend that they put themselves first because it's so important. And it's it's too hard to take care of somebody like, like you guys are doing all together. If you don't feel well, if you feel lousy, it makes it even more difficult. A bad situation becomes worse. And I don't understand why. So I have one daughter. She's almost 33. Why? Like her health was important, but so was mine. Right. But when it came to my mom, it was like she almost always took precedent. And my mom lived in memory care after my dad passed away. 
So it's not like I had the 24 seven of dealing right. directly with her. I mean, I was right. still in charge. I liked, I called myself the captain of her care team. I'm, I have yet to figure out why, I guess, because we know they have a disease. Yes. We're trying to fix something that's not fixable. Like I think subconsciously it's like, yeah. well, maybe this one blood test or this right. pill or whatever. Right. I, th I think that's it too. I, we're caretakers. And it's it, if you you always have to have some hope. Otherwise, what's the point? You know, and that's very true. That yeah. was, that's probably the direction we need to educate caregivers is it's a terminal disease, but there's a lot of life that's still going on. And right. that's what we need to nurture. Well, and but, you want to make it as I would assume as smooth for <laughs> the patient as you can. And as mm -hmm. smooth for yourself. And I can see that that might be a choice sometimes. It might be really hard to make. Um, sometimes if you make your patient happy, you're making yourself unhappy or vice versa. And I mean, it's a hell of a dilemma. Yeah, it definitely is. So how do you suggest that women specifically, and even some men to some point, because my husband didn't advocate for himself a year ago, and I'm... I really should have just demanded to go with him to the doctor because yeah. this doctor basically had a one treatment option and did not accept that that treatment didn't fit into reality. So my husband got a huge wound on the bottom of his foot that was very deep. And the, the treatment was literally the doctor told him, go sit on your ass for the next three to four months. Oh my God. My husband said, which makes sense. You can't heal a wound if you're constantly putting pressure on it. And my husband went, okay, well, I have a problem because I have to work and I have to drive so I can do my job. And this, um, air quotes, brilliant, an, an air quote doctor <laughs> said, can't you just take a leave of absence? And my oh husband's my like, from my own business? No. <laughs> and for and, three or four months? No. <laughs> yeah, it's like, and, and he said, no, because then I won't even be able to pay my mortgage, much less my health insurance. And I am 99% certain it'll take a whole lot to change my mind. I am convinced that that doctor said, well, I'll just wait till you have, till I have to amputate your toe or your foot or whatever. My husband got an infection from the doctor's office and lost his toe. And the doctor oh, did basically say, I told you so. Oh my Lord. We, yeah. I, I asked for an occupational therapist so that they could demonstrate ways my husband could continue in a more limited capacity to do the things that he thought were as important, um, but still not putting pressure on the foot, they refused. My husband offered to self-pay for a wound vac, which is supposed to help speed up the healing. They said no. I mean, it was like, wow. you're not going to do this one thing. I'm not going to work with you. That is, that is the message I got. I never saw this guy in person. I did not let the hospital let him do the amputation. It's like, that guy's already screwed you up. <laughs> like, no, right, like right. I was so terrified that they were, he was going to lose much more than a toe. Of course. And he is the kind of person that would be a horrible care patient. Yes, right. I am too. <laughs> I have to admit it. Yeah. Uh, um, well, I, I, that's why I advocate second opinions. And I'm, I'm so firm. I, I believe in them so firmly. You know, I think what, what I learned and I did not know until I did the research, there are so many, although this probably doesn't quite apply to your husband, but there are so many different diseases out there. I mean, like 40 or 50,000 of them. Jesus. And those are just the ones we know about. I mean, like COVID's probably 50,001. You know, we didn't know about it. But the point is, a lot of the, the symptoms mimic each other, too. So for the doctor, I mean, in their defense, a diagnosis, you have to be like a detective. It can be really tricky. If you go in and you say, oh, my God, I'm tired and I have pain and I have no appetite. I mean, you know how general those symptoms are and they're real. I mean, I don't mean that they're not. But the doc that, that gives the doctor about what out of the 50,000 that probably eliminates five. So now he's got, you know, I mean, it's really a job for, for doctors to, 
to get the right diagnosis. I mean, sometimes it's obvious you break your leg and you go in and you say your leg hurts. And I mean, that's not brain surgery, but by the same token, that's why it's so important to get a second opinion. And the other thing I learned that I thought was really interesting is like, like all of us doctors see what they expect to see. So you take a set of general symptoms and you go to a psychologist and he'll say, or she'll say there's stress. If you go to a rheumatologist, they'll say it's joint pain. If you go to a gastro enterologist they'll tell you it's a stomach issue so you again you want a different perspective from your second opinion but it's a really important thing to get my rule of thumb just for myself is if I do need, ever do need a second opinion and I'm in San Francisco and my doctor has been trained in San Francisco I want a second opinion from somebody in New York I mean I, I want a, somebody with different training I don't want the same training because I'll get the same opinion which may or may not be accurate it's the different perspective is what I want that makes sense so how yeah. do we politely say I would assume I respect your diagnosis, but I would like to get a second opinion. Is that maybe the... Just, well, there's a couple of things I would say. What What do you think about, I'd like to get a second opinion, you know? And one thing, j just like that, I mean, a lot of doctors, I was on a show with the doctor, actually, and she said that she really likes when people get, when patients get a second opinion. For one thing, it confirms, because she's never 100% sure because of everything I just said. And she said, too, if, in case of malpractice, it's nice to have a confirming opinion it makes the malpractice suit go away so I, I mean she's right you know that's really interesting but one thing somebody said to me you sh you could say if you're feeling resistance you could say you know to the doctor you could say something like I know you've seen a lot of patients with my symptoms I you know you've had a lot of experience have all of the patients that you've seen with these symptoms suffered from disease X or is there has there been other possibilities that you can think of that maybe we should check out something like that um, and I think that's a nice way to put it you're you're saying I know your experience, but I mean, hey, listen, you know, you're not perfect. Is really what you're saying. Um, well, that sounds that sounds like good wording, and mm -hmm. I would think a second opinion is also kind of a way to cover your own fanny, so to speak. Sure, sure, it is. I mean, if you're if they find something different, doesn't mean you're less of a doctor. It just means right their perspective allowed you, or you know, just luck of the draw. I have. Um, a recent past guest who is living with Alzheimer's, also an author of um, the book, Still Me. And she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's like in the blink of an eye because her general physician realized that two things that she had said were significant warning signs. One is that she went from sleeping four to five hours a night to sleeping nine or 10 hours a day. And she just very offhandedly said, oh yeah, and I got lost coming to this doctor's office I've been yeah. coming to for 20 years. Right. Red flag. Yeah, and for sure. Not every doctor would have caught that. They might have thought, you know, it's very easy to dismiss some of those things. Mm -hmm. And her physician did not. So she was diagnosed very quickly, which is very rare. But yeah, you know, it just, is very rare. The, the one question she couldn't answer was with whether that physician had dealt with a family member that had had Alzheimer's. Because I, my guess is they must have. They must have. Right. That's just. Two, two on the nose for that one. Yeah, absolutely. So Does it do you, help if you get Alzheimer's diagnosed more, more quickly? Um, there are do now treatments. At all? Huh? Well, there are now treatments, um, you know, it depending. Um, so there's a drug called Lakembi. It's also called mm -hmm. Lakanumab is the drug. Lakembi is the brand name. And there's a second one coming. That's actually, Lakembi is the second. Then the demand... <laughs> Nanomab is the third. And for some reason, that one's getting delayed, which is hmm. kind of interesting to kind of watch. And it's supposed to slow down the progression. I think that's what I read. Yeah, for some for some months. There is a risk of a brain bleed. Um, depending on what studies you read, this is either not that, you know, it's pretty rare or, right. you know, they have to pay attention to that potential okay. risk because obviously brain bleed is bad. Right, but, but so is Alzheimer's. Yeah, <laughs> both of them are going to get you. Right. The question is, you, it only works on people in the early stages, so you have to get diagnosed early or else, you know, right. you're out of luck. But they don't know how 
long they can slow the progression. Okay. So that's kind of the hang up. So if you're, I met a gentleman in 2023, I think he was in his late fifties that had, I think he was 58. Don't, don't quote me on it, but I think he, and all he wanted. So we were back in DC basically fighting because Lakembi was the only FDA approved drug at the time, Mm -hmm. not covered by Medicare. So we were basically rattling the cages of, legislators and trying to get them to rattle the cage of CMS to cover the cost of it, which is it's an infusion. I think it's every two weeks and it's expensive. Of course, (laughs) what new drug isn't right. And all he wanted at that time was to have the same cognitive ability when his grandson turned three, as he had when his grandson turned two, all he wanted. Now, my theory with the drugs, and this is like getting way, not way off topic, but a little off topic, but we'll talk about it really quick, yeah. is it's, it's tricky. You have to decide if you think you can get enough good, more, enough more good time. Very bad grammar. But I know what you're saying. Yeah. Is it worth that, it, what you're saying? Yeah, because what I did with my mom is I tried to give her the most quality of life without prolonging dying from Alzheimer's. Right. Generally, what happens is your brain forgets how to do things like eat and walk right. and use the facilities. And this gal from that wrote the book, Still Me, she doesn't want to get in that. She doesn't want to be there. Mm-mm. Now, she's not younger. So she, what she's been doing, and this is why her episode was so important, is she has done all kinds of lifestyle interventions. And we even talked about... Um, Susan and I were talking about the brain cognitive benefits of art and being creative. This is one thing she took up painting. Now, this is a gal that used to be the president of some colleges, not small ones. Wow. And she just, you know, never thought she was artistic. She was actually told she wasn't very good when she was a kid. So yeah, um, she took up that. So there's, there's a lot of lifestyle interventions. I don't think modern life is good for our brains. Yeah, it's like a whole other episode, but I right, talk about right. that a lot. So, you know, it's important to implement the lifestyle changes, make your own decisions about the medications, you know, and then maybe that'll keep you out of the doctor's office quite a bit. Because what happens is they you've got situations that trigger like a very negative reaction, like anger, anxiety. And sometimes, you know, when we're angry, we react physically in a not so great way right that's somebody you can't reason with that's doing that sometimes you end up at the doctor's office and they give you uh what is it psychotropic medications that are kind of controversial so we want to keep our loved ones out of the doctor's office yeah i was going to ask you before we went off on this huge tangent. yeah no but it's fascinating (laughs) um is you my issue with trying to get appointments with a specialist because I'm at the moment waiting for my ENT appointment that I've been waiting for for months is ENT is an ear, nose and throat doctor. For those of you who don't have to deal with them (laughs) is the timeline. Like I needed to go see, I needed to go back to the, my original ENT in like February, but we switched healthcare providers in March, which now means I'm not going to the new ENT until July, which means this problem with my throat, my voice will have been happening for a year. Like, I don't even remember what my voice doesn't sound like all cracky and 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 it's going to be weird if it ever goes back the way it was. (laughs) But if I go to the doctor, this new ENT on July 1st, and he or she is not um, open to my suggestions that I've done everything the first ENT said, and there's been no noticeable improvement. Now we need to look at something else and they just kind of blow me off. We're not, we're going to hope that's not what happens. It's going to be another three or four months before I get to see somebody else. If I get to see somebody else that quickly. So you still recommend second opinions, even though that's our, our reality. Yes. I don't even have to think about it. (laughs) And I honestly, I don't. Because really, think about it. You don't want to be treated for a disease you don't have. I mean, it's that true. Simple. I mean, so if talk I, about if, a mess. But what I think <laughs> I would do, if, if if she does or he, if they do blow you off, um, 
I think I'd say I, I'd go in with a list of all the medications and the, the amount, the dosages that I've taken, how long I took them for. Even if you don't remember, I might, you know, fudge it up a little bit so that they can see this is what I've done and this has not worked. So you you can hand them the list in case they're not listening, which can happen. You know, I don't know how tired they are or busy or whatever. So what the question is, what else could this possibly be? It can't be gastric. You can't be stomach acid because look at all the things I did. Uh, if it was something else, what would it be? I would just really advocate for myself. That's the message of my book. You've got to, and you don't want to wait another three months. I mean, it'll be it'll be a year or more. What if it's something serious? You're letting a minor, not and and it, they are letting a minor situation become a major one. And you, if if that's what happens, and you don't want that, you need to mm -hmm. really say. We got to do something about this. I can't wait another three, four, five months, whatever it is. And you can't. I mean, even if you just go to, I don't know what. I mean, well, you're in a small town, aren't you? Sort of, you're you're a top. I'm, I'm an hour north of Sacramento, so yeah. So I mean, it is a small town, but I'm not. It's I don't consider it rural. I think technically it's kind of rural, but. Well, I'm know. don't. You know, it's easy for me to say get a second opinion. I mean, I, I I'm in San Francisco or close to it. I have a, a, a ton of resources, but not everybody does. I understand that. But if you possibly can, I would certainly not wait. If that's what they tell you, I would not wait another three, four, five months. I'd go in July. It's not that far away. I can't believe it, but it isn't, <laughs> you know, at this point, what the hell, but, um, but I would go in with a list. I'd go in a list of symptoms and the list of dosages and a list of the appointments I've I've had and the diagnoses I've received and check them, let them check them off. It, you, you know already that it isn't this or it isn't that because you've been to the doctor before. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, it's hard. I'm, it's hard not to worry that it's something more serious. Of course it is. Um, I was really unhappy the day, you know, I they called to make schedule the referral appointment and they're like, okay, well, our first available is, you know, there was, it was a date that I would have had to juggle a lot of stuff to make happen. Right. And right. I just thought, and I said, I can make that date work, but what's the next open date? And I, I, like I a, do that. Yeah. A day or two later. I'm like, a couple of days isn't going to make a big difference. So I'm like, let me have that yeah. one. And then they're like, oh, well, instead of it being in my town, it's 45 minutes away. It's practically in Sacramento. Yeah. I'm like, okay. Well, if we got to do that, then we got to move it to the afternoon because I'm not, you know. Right. I don't skip my workouts for very much. So Good for you, <laughs> yeah, I, I try not to, but I do. <laughs> um, and I'm I'm the kind of person is once we get past lunch, I eh, can pretty much guarantee it's not going to happen. Even if I haven't showered or anything, That's I'm me. pretty, pretty faithful on that one. It just makes me feel correct. Yeah, so I've I've got time to reread the book and think about what I want to tell them. I do know that it could still be silent reflux, but sure. it might it might require a surgical fix, which ugh, that doesn't thrill me at all. But neither does sounding like a fourteen year old boy with my voice cracking all the time. <laughs> <laughs> no offense to fourteen year old boys, but oh my god, I'm it tired is of a jelly. It. Your voice sounds fine to me. I didn't know you before, so I'm not sure I'd go for surgery. I didn't know that you anything was wrong with you. I mean, seriously, there's times when. So I'm also um, launching a professional speaking career. Huh, timing is <laughs> terrible. Um, <laughs> the more I talk, the worse my voice gets. Okay. And it gets it gets to the point where it feels my throat feels very tight, not sore like I've got a sore throat, but just right. constricted. So I'm going to make all yeah. these notes. If I can figure out how to send them to the doctor ahead of time. I did that. That would with, be fabulous. Yeah, I did that when I first got uh, when I went to the general my original general physician with this problem because I'm like I think this started back here and it did that, that, that I like yeah. it was like a whole friggin' novel. So so basically I should go in and armed with as much information as possible because they do need it and then yeah. well and politely. i like what you said and one of the things i do recommend is that you should go in with a written list of your symptoms and i say written because at least if you're at all like me i get anxious when i'm there and i forget what i came in for basically um not quite but almost i certainly if i go in with five things in my head i'll remember three of them you know um so if you go in with a written list, in fact, the same doctor that was talking about malpractice said she loves it when her patients come in with a written list because then she can read it 
and maybe they haven't prioritized it correctly. Um, she told me the story of this guy that she saw and the visit was over and she was leaving, you know, just about to leave the room. And he said, incidentally, I've got this mole on my back. Do you, and that was the most important thing he could have said the whole visit. So she really likes a written list because if that had been on his, if, if he had had a list and that had been on it, she would have done that first. Um, so anyway, a written list is really important for sure. Well, then they can just add it to your chart too. And what'd you say? Well, they can add it to your chart, sure. something to refer back to. Sure. Um, and I just read, and I don't know if it was your book or something else. Maybe it was both. When they call and confirm my appointment, it would be smart for me to ask how long that appointment is scheduled for. Yeah, that so if I think it's, book, but it's great advice and I did not put it in there. I should have. I like that. Because uh, obviously I can get a little chatty. Um, yeah, me too. And unless you frustrate me and I'm trying to be polite and I'm biting my tongue, then, I, <laughs> then it's the opposite. But knowing how much time they have, you know, you're not going to waste it. Now, I always assume it's like five to 15 minutes max. So I try to get everything out in the beginning. Yes. But not to get too chitty chatty. With it. Right. And that's why you should go in with the list. That's yet another reason, because I try to get it all out, too. And I talk a lot. I mean, I do. And I, and what I not I don't know. I'm not necessarily the most succinct person you've ever met. And if I have it written out, it's more organized. And they don't get lost in my words, which can I've had happen. Well, um, and if you get nervous, you know, you get white coat and syndrome, yeah. which my blood pressure is always higher at the doctor's office, which I sure, never feel too. anxious. <clears throat> so, um, so, there's okay. A, so, white coat syndrome. I mean, there's a term for that, you know. And I always tell them that because I get really annoyed. It's, it never, well, it never really reads alarmingly high. It's always like, hmm. Yeah. This is a borderline, like needing right, statins. And it's like, no, no, I'm fine. Trust me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. Um, and we have a blood pressure med, you know, reader at home. So it's like, yeah, I can check do. it. Yeah. Um, so we're making a list of what the important top or the important in pieces of information. We're asking how long the appointment should is scheduled for so that we don't inadvertently screw up the rest of their day. We're politely asking for a second opinion or we're trying to politely guide them into thinking of it from a different direction if we don't what think we're being listened to. Be? That's what you want to know. Yeah. Could it be something else? Might be. Right. Um, that seems like a fair question and it's not too, I wouldn't think that it's Rather too. Rather than could it be, which would be a yes or no. I mean, I like what else could this, I mean, of course they could say nothing, but there's always something. I mean, you know, there, there, there's too many out of the 50,000 diseases. It can't just be this one, you know. That is true. I, and I, I don't actually ever Google symptoms because I know it can be everything from, you know, oh, it's allergies or death. You know, it's like... Well, you know, you just said the most important thing. And I'm so into our conversation. I completely forgot to mention the, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you said this. The, the most important part of my book is the resource list at the back of the book. And what that is, is I have it um, organized by categories. So if you want to research your doctor, it tells you how to do that. If you want to get a second opinion or go to websites, instead of Googling, it has some very... Um, very good websites there that I know are reliable. They're but basically the ones I used for my book. You might, yeah, exactly. It's, so it's get this it's in the camera, list. and it's yeah, it's upside down. It's it's pages and uh, it's several pages. I mean, it's, it's like some hospitals specialize in cardiology, some in neurology. So if you're going for a heart transplant, you might not want to go to the one that specializes in neurology. You'd want to go to the one. So depending where you are, I mean, like in, again in San Francisco. There's or LA, I mean, there's or wherever. There's a lot of hospitals, um, so you can you can sort of choose depending which your, who your doc, which one your doctor is affiliated with. But you need to know what you're getting into. Um, there was some fun research done, although it wasn't so fun really. That we spent <laughs> about zero hours researching our doctor, and we spend about eight hours researching whether we get a new car, and 10 hours researching our a surgeon or the, uh, I'm sorry, a new job. Zero hours re, um, researching our surgery or our surgeon. So eight hours for a car, 10 hours for a job, zero hours for our health. Mm. And you know, if you think about it, that's probably not the best order. No, and I would never 
mostly because I don't I don't have health issues. I mean, the throat thing is annoying as hell, but you right. know, right. I, right. I'm assuming it's not life threatening. It, I've been dealing with right. it for almost a year, so I'm pretty sure right. it's not no, life threatening. Right. Um, so I don't have, you know, it's like, I don't have a lot of experience and I wouldn't, wouldn't have thought about researching the hospital. Now I'll tell you an interesting story, just a personal one that I've never had pain. I mean, I work out a lot and I mean, I'm 81. I've never had pain the last six months. All my hips have been hurting and everybody says, well, you know, you're 81, excuse me, but shit happens, right? Get (laughs) over it. Well, I'm, you know, okay, but I don't want to get over it. I've never had it before. It's different. I don't like it. So I am going for an MRI, but, and I do, do I think it's arthritis? Yes, I do. But on the other hand, I don't want to be a victim of my own ageism. And what if it isn't? I need to have it checked out. And, you know, God, gosh, I love Medicare because it doesn't cost anything. But um, nevertheless, that that's my point. You really want to I'm advocating for myself. I mean, there's a 99% chance it's it's old age, probably pulling things because I do work out a lot, but, and it probably is arthritis. I mean, that's not that rare disease, you know, but I want to be careful and I want to be, I just, I want to be careful and cautious. Let's put it that way. Do you do enough stretching? I do. Oh no, I do. You should go to my website, everybody. It's called on TikTok. It's called Grandma Dot Gains. And if you want to know what Grandma Gains means, G A I N S, I did not know what I meant, what it meant. My grandchildren named the site. And it means gaining means you gain, you gain muscle, you're gaining weights that you can lift. And they said, Grandma, everybody knows what that means. Well, of course, nobody my age knows what it means. <laughs> but anyway, so Grandma Dot Gains. And you'll see, I mean, I really work out. And I'm this little, I mean, I'm little. I'm 4'10, I weigh 104 pounds. And I can bench press, man. And that's important, but I can very well see that I may have pulled a muscle or strained it. And and I, I'm such an idiot that I can't stop. I mean, I could just let it rest a while, but that, you know, that occurred to me and I dismissed it immediately. So, so I, I, I keep doing it. I like to tell people I belong to the cult of Peloton. Because once yeah. you really get into Peloton, it, it gets kind of addictive, which could be a good thing, but it's also, you got to be careful. And one of the things I do almost every single day is full body 10 minute stretch and the hip flexors as we age from sitting, walking, working out, your hip flexors get really tight Yes, and it screws up your stride. It causes pain. So, and I'm a writer, so you can imagine how much I sit, you know? Yep. Yeah. It's not, uh, so look up some hip hip flexor stretches might help out. (laughs) Yeah, but I'll try it. I'll try anything because it this is just intolerable, frankly. Well, and what's I'm interesting, and we're we're sidebarring again, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> is you know we build up like cardio endurance fairly quickly. We yeah. build on strength, not as quickly as cardio endurance. It takes more time. Building up flexibility takes forever. Yes, it does. It's I ridiculous. Agree. So. It is. No, I completely agree. And, you know, I think for caregivers, if they have the time to try to make the time to, to go for a walk or do something that gets you outdoors, gets you into your body, your own body and not not your your patients, whether it's your mother or your husband or partner or whatever. It's so important, isn't it, to do some self-care? It really is. Yeah. And you can do it in little five minute segments, five, right. 10 minutes five minutes here, five minutes there. You know, you don't have to go do an hour yoga, you know, drive and go do an hour yoga class. Right, right. Again, Peloton's got a lot of 10 minute classes, people. Yeah, right. No, <laughs> I've, been, I've heard Peloton's great. It's, it's they're so, the instructors are so motivating and personal and just like, you know, you can be like, well, I need a, I need a motivational person today. So I'm going to pick this instructor. And it always seems like I pick the right class for the mood. Even though well, do you I have don't, a bike or a treadmill or what do you I have? I have the bike plus the bike and I've been doing, so I did in April, I did uh, glutes and legs, really heavy weights. Wow. You want to talk about sweating? My garage is like 54 degrees and I'm just dripping wet. That's how much oh, muscle wow. you're using Yeah. Um, with the weights and good yeah, shape. Uh, it's, and you lose more weight when you put on muscle. So these are also yeah, good things. Do. It's true. <laughs> just don't hurt yourself. Right. So 
before we get too too long we've we've discussed how we need to approach things is there one last good piece of information we should leave the listeners with besides just read the whole book because it's really really helpful it's helped me navigate changing health systems which has really been a pain in the butt (laughs) at least i think it is my husband thinks it's gone really smoothly so that should tell you something (laughs) <laughs> That's very interesting. I think the one message I would I would say is really it's your body. I'm I'm really a strong proponent of advocating for yourself because it's your body, your health. You've only got the one body, and your first job is to take care of it. Because the better you feel, the better caretaker you will be, whether it's for your family or a dementia patient or who whomever. Um, you, you'll find that you'll just be in much better shape emotionally if you can possibly find, as you said, just five minutes here and there to take care of yourself. I mean, that's really the message of the book and to advocate for yourself when you go, go, go when you go to the doctor, go in prepared, make sure you have all your questions down and make sure they get answered. Um, and that's up to you. Nobody's going to leave the room when you're in the middle of a sentence or if they do change doctors. Yeah, for real. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, but truthfully, that that's the best thing I can say. Don't let yourself agree to something like I did that you know damn well you don't need. Um, that's the message. Well, I love that message. And until we can get more dementia training for our healthcare professionals, we're going to have to keep advocating for ourselves and our loved ones and right. exactly. make them see that there's technically two patients in the room. Correct which, you know, they really don't have time for. That's a whole other, that's a whole other book. <laughs> right. Yeah. No. And that, that is harder to control because that's a, that's a structural problem and it's harder to do something about that. You can only control what you can control. Um, if the true. doctor allots 15 minutes, that's what you've got. Whether, whether they should allot 20 or 30 is not up to us. I mean, I might wish, but that's a different issue. And it might be smart if you know they've got 15 minutes, try to wrap it up in 12. Yes. If that's possible. I agree. I agree. And you know what? You just might if you're organized when you go in. True. Um, They'll have to do less detective yeah. digging type questions. Exactly. Right. Here's here are my symptoms. Here's what here's what you know, here's what I here are my symptoms. Here's what I've done. Here's what I here are my dosages. Here's what I've taken. Where what else do you think it could be? What else is there to do? And now it's their turn, you know. That sounds like a five minute appointment if you're lucky. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then you can get the hell out and go to lunch. You know? Yeah, for real. After you've spent 20 minutes in the waiting room after you were 15 minutes early. But if you, you're going to be their favorite patient if you give them time back in their schedules because right. um, just for your knowledge and to remind the listeners is I did an interview with a doctor who did his first year of residency and took a sabbatical to work with um, some, I, I refer to him in the risk, the episode is Tech Bros. They built a website called Olera Care, so it's O L E R A dot uh-huh. care, and it basically helps physicians as well as families find resources in their local area for caring for somebody with some form of dementia. Now, what came out in this this talking with this young doctor <laughs> was that he also had an MBA, uh-huh. and I was just blown away. And I have a business degree. I'm not ever going to get a medical degree. <laughs> I should have yeah. one by default, but right. um, doctors are basically also in charge of running a business. Sure they are. On top of everything. So they've got so much to do. Right. And if we can keep that in mind and try to streamline our, uh, our appointment, right. we might get better care just because we're so much easier to deal with, which yes. when you're dealing with dementia is not always possible, but at least if we try. Right. No, I agree completely. And I think that's true. I mean, when my dad was in the hospital, I was so easy to deal with that we got really lovely care. And people down the hall didn't do so well because they were angry or whatever they were. Um, I just remember that vividly years ago, but I do remember that. Um, You have to work with them, even though sometimes everybody's doing their best. I mean, and their best may not be good enough. But that doesn't mean they're not doing their best. That's um, also something good to keep in mind. So keep it yeah. streamlined. Give them as much information 
beforehand or right at the beginning of the appointment. Don't be afraid to ask for a second opinion. Right. You only have one body and one life, and it's your job to help make them help you take good care of it. Absolutely. Well said. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I got it from you, but this has been fantastic. And I'm just going to reiterate, I really feel like it's a really excellent book to read for everybody because, you. you know, you need to, we need to learn how to work with the system we currently have, even though That's many right. of us would like to see a different system. And until we have a different system, this is a great there way to help teach yourself Thank you. How to be a better patient and a better advocate. Right. Right. And the book's available on Amazon or wherever. And it's hot linked in the show notes. So you guys don't even oh, have right. to go looking for it. Just click right. the blue, the blue link and poof, Amazon will open up Love and it. take your money. <laughs> well, thanks so much for having me. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.